Republic instead. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? The women with the least likelihood of getting pregnant are the ones most worried about having abortions. On January 6th of 2021, you had tens of thousands of people peacefully protesting. So, it's not a right-wing conspiracy theory. It's not QAnon. It's real. <laughs> On today's Enemies List, I am proud to be joined by John Judas and Roy Teixeira. These gentlemen know a lot about the numbers, the demographics, the, the changes of our population and our society and our culture, and exactly how they affect our politics, because everything is downstream of that in American politics. Um, and because of their insight, I wanted to have a conversation with them today about a few things that, that, that I'm curious to know about, um, about how America's demographics and, and, and how our, our, our cultural changes are going to shape what happens in 2024. Are we over or under counting any demographic? Um, you know, what about Gen Z? We've got a lot of questions today, so I will get right to it. Uh, John mm-hmm. and Roy, thank you so much for coming on the enemies list today. Hey, our our pleasure. Well, let me start right out and ask this question. What do you think is the big unknown or un, un, seen story, the story we're not paying attention to about a demographic group in the 2024 election and why it's important? Well, I, I we, we might have different answers. I'll tell you mine and then Rui can tell right. you his. And he's better on the actual numbers. We always, I always rely on Rui. So um, the, the, the big group I would say are, you could call them undecided voters, but if you look at the uh, voter identification over the last 20 years, 15 years, after 2008, there's an enormous jump in the number of people who don't identify with either party. Now, the political scientists will tell you correctly that some of them lean Democratic and some of them lean Republican, but it's a group of, you know, maybe... 25 to 50 percent of the electorate and they are convincible one way or the other so i don't believe in this kind of thing where where it all depends upon where two or three percent of the electorate goes i think that's there's much bigger possibilities and people have to have to uh pay more attention to that group and it's also a group that one of the things we know about it is that it's for the most part not amenable to the extremes of either party. And I think that's why they are in de- identify themselves as refusal to disclose or independent. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They don't like either the Republican extremists or the Democratic extremists. Um, yeah, I mean, go ahead. Well, I would add to that uh, it's related and overlaps um, is the question of, of peripheral voters. And this is very important for 2024. There's tens of millions of, of people who did not vote in uh, 2022, but are likely to vote in 2024. Right. A lot of, most of them voted in 2020. These voters uh, disproportionately lean Republican, lean toward Trump, or more conservative than the voters who did vote in 2022. And they're actually, interestingly enough, they skew young and non-white. So that's part of the reason why when the smoke clears and the dust settles in 2024, we may see some continued moves toward the Republicans among non-white and particularly among non-white working class voters because they're disproportionately represented in this group of peripheral voters who will surge into the electorate in this 2024 election Mm -hmm. and are kind of missed by uh, a lot of the way people have been thinking about politics in the very recent past and the way the the Democrats did relatively well in 2022 um, and how they've been doing well in special elections where you get exactly the most educated and committed voters Mm -hmm. um, uh, showing up. And in fact, there's sort of an emerging turnout paradox for the Democrats, which is that the higher turnout is, it's possible the worse they'll do. And people always thought it was reverse of that. And again, this overlaps very, very much with the group John's talking about, the independents, the people who are in the middle, the people who basically dislike both parties um, or are enthusiastic about either one. Uh, You know, that is, you know, arguably the key to what we're gonna see in, in 2024. And the fact that these groups are so large, the fact that they can look so much different than the most committed voters who show up just shows 
a lot of what we're talking about in the book, which is how neither party really uh, has a is that appealing to either uh, to the electorate at this point, You're leaving vast numbers of people who, in a way, they wind up voting on which party they, they dislike the most, which 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 issues become right. salient uh, that annoy them the most. And then they'll kind of vote on, for the other party, uh, you know, the one that doesn't have the views they dislike the most. That, I that, suspect, that, too, this go is going to be well, just one more thing. I, I mean, I suspect that this might be a low turnout election, not a high turnout election mm -hmm. like 2020. Uh, the, uh, the there was tremendous fear of, uh, I think, of, of Trump drove a lot of the voters, uh, either fear or enthusiasm. I, I think there is going to be a certain weariness or disinterestedness uh, this time. But I, I don't know. And the other factor in that, you know, in that undifferentiated mass is the third parties. That's something we really can't tell yet and uh, could have an influence. Uh, I think more on Biden's vote. I think it's I think he is in more danger even from the RFK, though they say now Kennedy will pick up Trump voters. I think that that's uh, I think that that could potentially be a big uh, problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching RFK just based on. Boomer and and the and the remaining silent generation name ID alone on the on the Kennedy name on the ballot anywhere, um, but I I, mean, I, th I think some of the models show that J that RFK's messaging has been more Republican centric. But I I've always observed that Republicans are much more likely to go home to the nest uh, at the end of the campaign cycle. Um, I, I, th that's one of the things I've, I've sort of been curious about is like the predicate of the third parties of no labels and of, of anybody in the third party space really is there's a big centrist middle and nobody really likes these extremes. And so they, they just, the, the voters can't wait to find that person right in the, in the, in the Goldilocks spot in the middle, but they always, those numbers sort of fritter away at the end. They always seem to go back to the bases mm -hmm. um, and the Republicans, I think more intensely, than, than the Democrats, which is why I think no labels, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, is why I think the no labels people are a risk to the country in some ways, because I think they will end up draining away moderate Democrats more than more, more than moderate Republicans. I think the moderate Republicans end up going home, unfortunately. Yeah, well, that is that is the conventional wisdom. And, uh, you know, like a lot of conventional wisdom, there's probably some truth to it. I mean, there is some data out there that is more ambiguous about where no labels voters who might, no labels voters might hurt the most, but I think the preponderance of evidence is is probably a sort of uh, plausible no labels candidate might wind up taking more from Democrats than Republicans, and certainly there there is no the fantasy that so, you know like there are tens and tens of millions of voters out there who are in the center don't like either parties who the moment a no labels candidate appears they will you know rush to the barricades and throw their votes <laughs> uh to to that centrist candidate i think that's a fantasy because we live in a very partisanized world they may not like you know one <laughs> one thing that drives partisanship as we know isn't so much people love the party they identify with but they really hate the other side really yeah. hate it so that negative partisanship is something that drives uh, partisans of both parties uh, towards staying with their party. Uh, because it, it seems like the enforcement so mechanism of, of both parties is that is the negative partisanship. It's an, it's a social enforcement. It just keeps them frozen in place or, or, or unwilling to move at, to, to put it more mildly, I think. Um, so mm -hmm. we've talked a lot about it across politics the last couple of years. Cause I mean, of, of course I, I wrote this book about running against Trump in 2018, and I said, you know, the, the tr secret about young voters is they tend to not be voters. Mm -hmm. um, now, we've started to see a change and evolution in that. Talk to us a little about what you're seeing about the emergence of more uh, of younger voters in the in the in the in the 22 and uh, the 20 and 22 elections, particularly because it has become a really hot topic. And and I haven't gone through the numbers, you know, mm -hmm. at, at, with a high degree of granularity, but it certainly has has attracted a lot of political attention, particularly on the Democratic side. Well, the younger voters have, I, I think that again goes back to the early 2000s, doesn't it, Rui? Yes, it uh, does. Iraq okay. War, um, that generation, the uh, Obama vote, uh, you started to see the millennials all come in as Democrats. And uh, 
the, the assumption always is that as people get older, they become more conservative, but that really uh, hasn't panned out to some extent among the uh, millennial voters. Mm -hmm. And this new generation, the, the Z generation, whatever, is, um, uh, ha has, seems to have a kind of anti-establishment edge to it. In Europe, uh, a lot of that generation goes right rather than uh, left. And uh, in the United States, uh, you do get uh, some kind, so, some degree right, right, right wing extremism among that generation, but more sure. left, much more left. And uh, that's the way it seems to be uh, trending. It's not, you know, from all the polls that I've seen, uh, Biden is not the, not the right candidate to bring those voters out, uh, mm -hmm. mainly uh, age. Just he's too stodgy. I mean, he doesn't, um, you know, he, he, he's not he's not uh, dynamic. So, well, I, yeah, I think it goes think a little deeper than that. Problem. I mean, I think that um, if you look at the underlying approval ratings for Biden among uh, and, and views on the economy, approval ratings on the economy, uh, underlying views on the economy and young voters, it's extraordinarily negative. So they actually are not that enthusiastic about the job Biden's done with the country. Now, they probably, many of them really dislike the Republicans as, as well, and, and in fact, a lot more. But I think there is a basis there for us to see attrition among mm -hmm. the younger generation vote, particularly the under 34 voters. Um, and we're always seeing that in the polls that are being taken. And this, this gets back to the thing I was mentioning a little earlier about peripheral voters. The young voters who surge into the electorate in the 2024 election, I think it's actually quite possible that the Democrats' margin among these voters will drop from what it was in, in 2020. So, um, I mean, in a way, this is like brings us to the whole demographics is destiny kind of sure. argument, which we talk about in our book and critique is something that is a bit of a, you know, a Kool-Aid for the Democrats because they're convinced that um, because of the way the country is changing in sort of raw structural demographic terms, they'll wind up overwhelming the other side because over time these groups get bigger and the Republican groups get smaller mm -hmm. and nothing is more powerful as a, as a simply a nose counting exercise than generational change. I mean, the non-white population is grow, growing a lot, obviously, and it's displacing white people, but it's growing a lot less slowly than the generational replacement is taking place. And of course, a lot of Democrats are now aware to their sorrow that there's actually attrition among the black and especially, uh, particularly Hispanic vote uh, for the Democrats. So, but younger so, voters are the big, are the big uh, hope now because mm -hmm. we know that the generational succession will happen. We know that Gen Z and millennials will become a bigger part of the electorate. We know that the baby boomers and the silent generation already are dying off. So therefore, it follows that if you replace, you know, the the, the former with a uh, the latter with the former, Democrats will benefit enormously. But that leaves out the question of what exactly happens to these voters uh, as you go into different cycles and how they view the Democratic and Republican parties and how enthusiastic they are. About I, I mean, to, to look, to sum it up this way, Biden has a lot of things that are problematic uh, in this 2024 election. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the centrist candidate in 20 in 2020. I mean, he did attract uh, those, what you're describing as the sure. no, no labels vote. And the election really was about Trump. Uh, he was kind of a blank slate, which is what you want, as opposed to when Trump ran against Hillary Clinton and it became about, you know, who you liked, li who, who you disliked less. So Biden has a lot of things, uh, attrition among young voters, uh, shifts among minority voters, uh, his age. Uh, and it really is going to take uh, some nonsense from Trump. And uh, we don't know what the indictments, we don't know what that, uh, how that's going to work out, whether he's going to be convicted. Uh, he, he's gotten more erratic over the years. I think he appeals much more to his. Uh, well, I, I followed him in 2015 and 16, and he was fun to listen to. I mean, you know, I mean, he would say offensive oh, things. Oh, he's a great he, entertainer. He was funny, you know, I, I, as opposed to going to the other campaigns. But I think he's gotten a lot nuttier. And uh, so, mm. I, I again, I think a lot of this, I hate to say this, but a lot of this election is going to revolve around whether it's about him again. I, I think that's right. I mean, it, it's very difficult for an, an election where he participates to not sort of have this 
uh, gravitational black hole effect of media coverage. Mm-hmm. But but I, 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 I'm curious about something you, you said, because I think this is an area that, that I have jumped up and down and screamed at Democrats about for about 10 years, because I, I spent a lot of time in Florida politics, mm-hmm. and it is changing on, on the ground here with particularly, I, I, it was a Hispanic men a while back. You started to see the shift where they weren't, they weren't as comfortable as they, as they would have been as a, as a secure vote for the Democrats as they would have been 20 years ago. And it's, it's now starting to break with, with younger African-American men. I know that's not a huge part of the voting pool, but it's, it's not, I think that the Democrats, and I'd love to see what your prescription of this would be. It's like, I feel like they need a wake up call that the, that the, you know, the assumptions about race and, and ethnicity are really becoming increasingly insufficient every cycle. Yeah, well, that's very much a theme of our book. John, you want to talk a little bit about that? Because we spend considerable time yeah. trying to debunk this idea of the rising America. Uh, Florida is our warning. I mean, is it a, we end a chapter with saying uh, that's the place to look at if you want to worry about the Democratic future, because that was a you see, it was a swing state. It was before that it was a Democratic state. And now it's shifting to being a pretty Republican state. I remember when the Puerto Ricans, a huge number of Puerto Ricans came to Orlando, that area. Oh, yeah. I-75 and people, I was on the New Republic and we wrote an article about how that was going to guarantee a Democratic majority. And <laughs> in, my, in, my, in, my first, in my first book, I wrote that I called somebody that in Hillary world and I said, who have you got handling the new Puerto Ricans? Yeah. And I got this sort of like, Indiana Jones answer, like top men. Don't worry about it. Top <laughs> men. The best. Um, we're sending our best. <laughs> we're sending our best. Um, uh, and, and I look, and, uh, uh, Florida is always the warning sign. We're the laboratory of bad ideas. We're the petri dish of craziness. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I do wonder. I do wonder sometimes. If, I my theory of the Republican Party's transformation in the era of Trump is that it's much more a cultural change than a demographic change. And I'm wondering if, if, if Democrats are going to miss a cultural cue with some of these uh, African-American or Hispanic voters. Um, and some of the cultural cues like that are Florida-specific were so easy and they just wouldn't focus on them. Like I, I told the Biden campaign at one point, go to Miami – stand in the middle of Cali Ocho, give a huge goddamn speech and say, Fidel Castro was a monster who should burn in hell. Who's going to be mad at you, Bernie? Uh-huh. So yeah, what? Right. <laughs> you, you pop the bubble with this community and, and yet he, they wouldn't and they couldn't, they were afraid to do something like that. And, and, and because of that, you ended up with this tidal wave of disinformation down there um, among Cuban and Venezuelan voters that, you know, Biden's the pro-communist, Biden loves Castro, Biden loves M- M- Maduro, all this, this stuff that, you know, couldn't have been further from the truth, but emotionally it worked with those communities. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me ask you this question, and I, I meant mm-hmm. to get to this in the beginning of the of the discussion. Mm-hmm. So your book's called Where, Are the, Where Have All the Democrats Gone? The Soul of the Party in the Age of Extremes. Where have all the Democrats gone? Why is it that this party that had that had this core of a sort of center left and and somewhat progressive, not maybe in the progressive sense of today, uh, but this sort of center left, uh, fairly optimistic view of the world? What has changed it so much? And I look at I look at the weird part of this as as like in the. It, when you saw Barack Obama, there were a lot of people who were like, okay, this is the future of the parties. We're, we're in control now for, for the long haul. He's captured the, the youth, the energy, the culture. It's a new Camelot. It's all these things. And it just didn't last. What mm-hmm. was it that caused that? What, 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 what are you guys identifying as, as, that, as the, the, the driver underneath that? Want me to do it, Rui? You... Yeah, why don't you lead off and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll chime in. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, this is the question of our whole book. Look, Indeed. you, you, the, the Democrats we're talking about is what used to be the core of the party, a uh, working class voters. And beginning, it was uh, primarily white working class voters. It was white working class voters from the South and from uh, 
sub suburban ethnic voters. Initially, civil rights was mm -hmm. a big, mm -hmm. big issue. Counterculture, uh, patriotism in the Vietnam War, things like acid amnesty and abortion. Right. <laughs> uh, in uh, starting with the 70s, the economics, whether the Democrats really could handle economics. And we had inflation then and inflation is a killer. And uh, again, that's another factor in 2024 to think about. And uh, in the 90s, you kept the Democrats doing a lot of things uh, that partly, again, reflect the loss of union strength in the country and in the party that favor corporations more than they favor ordinary voters. NAFTA, uh, China and the WTO, financial de deregulation. Um, you know, then with Obama, a health care bill that, re that helps the poor, but a lot of middle class people find their premiums going up. And there's this threat that the you know, older people, their Medicare is going to going to be cut. So, again, I think you can't say that. I mean, the, the common wisdom is that the Democrats are really much better on, on the economy for working class people. But uh, they have all this uh, uh, they have all this cultural baggage. Well, they do have the cultural baggage. And, we'll, you know, we'll talk about that. But they haven't been great on the economy either. I'm not saying the Republicans will be better, but there's a lot of people who lost their jobs uh, sure. in the China trade in Mexico. And that's a lot of the reason we lost uh, as Democrats, the Midwest, uh, North Carolina, where all the furniture jobs went. 100%. So that's a big deal. Then the la last step is the uh, is are the cultural questions. The Democrats think that if they're... Uh, for decriminalizing uh, illegal immigration, that that's going to attract Hispanic voters. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, defunding the police or, you know, however you want to put it. Uh, again, another a big reason why a lot of uh, minority voters go south. They don't want, a, you know, less police. They want better police, but they certainly don't want uh, right. less. Uh, the social issues, again, I think the Democrat, there's a moderate version, but the Democrats have taken uh, a, an extreme version. And I think that that's hurt them with these same voters, with these middle class, working class voters that used to be the heart of the party. Yeah, I, I mean, think that, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Go I right. would just say a thread that runs, runs through all of it from the economics to the culture is um, John was mentioning the decline of union influence uh, in the Democratic sure. Party, which was the vehicle to some extent for um, working class influence within the policymaking apparatus of the Democratic Party and how it was oriented. And once that declines and Democrats start paying less attention to working class voters and the representatives, uh, in a sense, the Democrats become freer to pursue the priorities of the people, the elites who are really influential within the party, which increasingly in the you know, 21st century comes to mean college educated elites with very liberal social positions and a variety of issues. And not only to uh, you know, sort of make those the positions of the Democratic Party, but to, to prioritize them, to promulgate them, to, to make them, uh, you know, a, a really salient part of how the Democratic Party makes its pitch. Because as it fades in a way, as a party that is uh, basically trying to represent and push working class interests, other things come to the fore. And the people who have these uh, pretty, you know, heftily liberal social positions gain more and more influence. We talk about the shadow party in our book, sure. which are the institutions, the NGOs, academia, foundations, uh, the party infrastructure itself, uh, so on and so forth, various intellectuals in and around the party who really do have an agenda that's quite, you know, very liberal and very far from the median working class voter on things like immigration, on things like race, on things like obviously the transgender issue is a great example of this because this has like no right. constituency among the traditional constituencies of the Democratic Party. But it does have a very strong constituency uh, among the elites who influence the Democratic Party and the college educated liberals who support them in the metropolitan centers. You know, it's it, I, I had a, a dinner one time with a very well-meaning Democrat and he said, I can't understand that. I don't get it. Why? How is it that, that that you guys have taken our voters away in South Georgia and North Florida, who were yellow dog Democrats for generations? I was like, God and guns, brother. <laughs> it is a it, those, these, these cultural signifiers that yeah. and, and I do think there's something I've observed in the Democratic Party that I think is is. 
it was not as prevalent in the Republican Party before Trump, but this like desire for conformity at every level of every, like even in a rural, a, a, a red or a purple or a leaning red district, there was this pressure for every Democrat to conform to sort of a national standard, a national ideal. And that yes. meant you were way all the way over on pro-choice, all the way over on gun control, that you right. went and told people in a, in a, in a, in a, in a mill town, yeah, the number one issue for me is climate change, not your jobs. That sort of stuff. It's a it's a tone deafness culturally that I think uh, I don't know how you beat it out of them. Because one thing Trump was great at reading was resentment culture, and and mm-hmm. that's the, and those low propensity vote the, in the polling that we had back in twenty and in sixteen. Those low propensity Republican voters, they were the ones who were coming out because they were angry, they were pissy. They, they there was no like sunny optimism there they were like i want to punish somebody because i don't have a job the mill closed etc we had a i was in a focus group one time and a guy so you know my dad worked in this particular uh wire wire harness plant in wisconsin and his dad worked there and they both had a little house on the lake and they you know had plenty of money put the kids through school he goes i was the third generation now my son is on his third tour in iraq and I'm now working in a call center for nine bucks an hour. So of course I'm going to vote for Trump because f all of y'all. I mean the that that. But those were cues I think the Democrats missed uh, about talking to those those working class voters, and 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 those somewhat exurban and rural voters as well. They just they just seemed like missed the like uh, it's not just the money of the elite class. It's I think there's always a sort of an aspiration in the Democratic operator class to be in that sort of socially um rarefied space in the democratic uh, you know the shadow party as you put it right yeah. well the, well the, the issue that i would bring up in in that connection is the runaway shops multinationals corporations yeah. going mm-hmm. overseas this was a big issue uh for the democrats believe it or not in, not in the 1970s the early 70s and then you know with the clo- shop closings in the 80s right they dropped it under clinton and uh, we have tax policies that encourage people to send send uh, uh, their uh, uh, capital overseas. That's um, right. And uh, there's an alliance in the Democratic Party really be, between kind of the donor class, neoliberal and economics, free sure. trade, open borders, whatever, and the social issues. Uh, the the uh, again, women's organization, civil rights organization, all of which have good causes. But again, it was a fusion of these two and the economics uh, get, gets ignored. And Trump comes in and says, you know, in Indiana, a carrier is going to send all its workers to right. Mexico and I'm going to prevent it. And in fact, you know, he doesn't really prevent it, but yeah, he makes that an issue. And uh, and he says, I'm going to make America great again. And people understand that it's not about making America white again. Again, it's about going to a store and seeing goods that are made in America, not made in China. So, uh, uh, again, the Democrats really miss that issue. And Biden, to his credit, uh, did understand that and he did start to pick up on it. I, I think he speaks working class better than any Democrat I've seen in a long time, honestly. Even Bill Clinton didn't quite. Bill Clinton didn't quite have Biden's ability to talk about working class families in that, especially in that northeastern industrial and, and midwestern industrial sense. Um, and I think he's I think he's the most articulate Democratic president on the on those things in my lifetime, certainly. Yeah, though it, it's worth noting that Obama did way better among those voters in 2012 than yeah. uh, Biden did in 2020. So, I mean, I, I think- I one think thing Trump took some of them. I mean, yeah, I, absolutely. Of course I mean the did. evolution um, was just there. But I think that, um, you know, one thing, I think Biden, you're right, is is more of a working class oriented, more comfortable with these voters. And I think that um, in his heart or whatever, and, and sometimes in what he says, he doesn't think of them as deplorables. I think the problem is, that an enormous sector of his party, uh, you know, sort of is particularly in the coastal enclaves and a lot of places, as you're pointing out, Rick, even in, you know, purple and reddish places, the people who run the party in mm-hmm. those areas feel they have to sing from the hymn book of the National Party. And, and that hymn book basically says people who voted for Trump, people who don't like the Democratic program and don't like what we're about and all the social issues that we push and our brand of economics. I mean, 
they are they are deplorables. They are reactionaries. They're probably you know closet or overt racists and xenophobes. Um, this prevents you from hearing the signals, Rick, that you're talking about that the Democrats should be able to receive and act upon and respond to, because essentially they categorize you know these vast swaths of voters as being people who belong to the past and are just grousing about things and are you know their status is under threat and they're mm -hmm. just like you know they're yesterday's news and we don't need to pay attention to them. Um, and I think that that's a big factor in how all this works out, despite Biden himself being, you know, better, way better than average Democrat these days about actually empathizing with yep. the working class. So what's the biggest takeaway um, that people should when they, when they read the book? When, it's called Where Have All the Democrats Gone? The Soul of the Party in the Age of Extremes, available on Amazon and everywhere else. Fine books are sold coming Only November today. the 7th. <laughs> um, hey, pre-orders count, folks. Pre-orders count. They always um, But uh, what's the biggest takeaway? What do you want people to walk with this book and have one bold-faced lesson uh, from reading this book? Well, I, I'd say it, the, it is that the Democrats have done best as a party, and they've done best for the country when they've been the party of the common man and woman. That's uh, that's Roosevelt's party. Mm -hmm. We're not advocating you can go back. You can't go back to the New Deal. We sure. shouldn't revoke it or repeal it. We should go beyond it. But we have to keep that in mind. And that means economically liberal policies, but it also means socially moderate policies. Right. Which Roosevelt, was very much Roosevelt, God bless yeah. America was his mm -hmm. theme song. I mean, he he. We have a holidays like Thanksgiving because of Roosevelt. <laughs> it's, uh, again, it's an understanding of uh, it's an understanding of where people in the country are at, not just where people in a few zip codes are at. That 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 takeaway that I think modern Democrats miss a lot um, is is that Americans love the iconography and the symbols and the feeling of America. They, they, yes, they know we're flawed as a country and all that, but, but Republicans steal all those, all those icons way too often. And, and the Democrats sort of leave them on the table. Like, you know, be proud of the flag, take it back. It doesn't belong to the Republicans. It's not their property, et cetera. Um, Amen, brother. Well, so folks, where can, where can people find you guys online? Um, and, uh, and, and where do you, where do you post these days? Cause it's, it's a, it's a crap shoot these days where people actually, do their socials. Well, Rick, funny you should mention that. Uh, I have a sub stack uh, that I do with some colleagues called The Liberal Patriot. I write a column that comes out every Thursday. Uh, and John, you know, Judas, uh, my friend here and co-author, and longtime pal, he writes for The Liberal Patriot as well and, and some other places. But Great. The Liberal Patriot, I certainly think, is a first stop for some of our latest thoughts on Terrific. issues. Terrific. Well, guys, thank you so very much for joining me today on the enemies list. Folks, the book is Where Have All the Democrats Gone? The Soul of the Party in the Age of Extremes. Uh, go out and get it. These, uh, As I said, John and Roy are two of the smartest guys in the business who really understand how the country's changing. And you know, if you're a Democrat, you were listening to this show today and you were kind of grinding your teeth at the three of us being sort of the, the center right guys who are, or center, center guys who are telling you what you're doing wrong. It's all even tough love is love. So with that, that's, thank that's you guys. Right. And we'll see you get folks again on the next episode of the enemies list. <laughs> well, I've mentioned him before, but on October 27th, representative Dean Phillips of Minnesota entered the presidential primary against Joe Biden. He has no chance to win. He has no path to victory. He has no possibility of even breaking through. However, I will say this very clearly he has been suckered by a bunch of consultants who have told him, hey, you're a rich guy. You've got a vodka company and a yogurt company. You're a rich guy. You could do this. People are just crying out for the gelato king of Minnesota to come and run for president. It's a lie. And Dean Phillips probably knows it's a lie. But his ego is so enormous. And the this persuasion these guys have applied to him is so, so um, seductive that he's going to run for president. Will it help anyone except Donald Trump? No. Every attack that Dean Phillips makes on Joe Biden will be echoed by the Trump campaign. Every attack that Dean Phillips makes on this president and his administration will echo in the, in the words of Fox News hosts that night. Every single bit of this does nothing but help Donald Trump. Anybody touching this campaign 
who says that they're part of the pro-democracy movement or that they give a shit about America or that they have some higher consideration in mind other than their, their venality is a liar. And that's not surprising knowing the people that are involved. However, I will say this about Dean Phillips, and I've said it a couple times now. This is not going to be pleasant. You will not enjoy this. And you, sir, are on the enemies list.